Welcome to the unit 10 and 11 uh, for anatomy and physiology one lab students. Uh, in these two chapters, we're going to be discussing the basics of the skeletal muscles in the human body, specifically some of the physiology and histology of the skeletal muscles in the first chapter. And in unit 11, we're going to be naming uh, muscles in the body. Uh, we're not going to name all of them, but we're going to name all the major uh, muscles, especially superficial and large muscles. And um, let's begin by discussing uh, kind of these basics first. So when we're thinking of the skeletal muscle, right, just like any other muscles, we categorize them as either voluntary or involuntary. In this case, the skeletal muscle is a voluntary type of muscle. These are very large muscle fibers, muscle cells. Um, <clears throat> now, um, the basic histology of the skeletal muscles that they have a lot of mitochondria because they are contracting often they're using up a lot of energy so mitochondria is the source of atp and energy for any cell and particularly is important for the skeletal muscle cells because they are very active and require lots of energy uh, um, now there is a certain change in naming for the skeletal muscle cells just like we have certain, certain other specialized cells so an endoplasmic reticulum, which we normally have in a regular cell, does all the same functions in a skeletal muscle, but here is called a sarcoplasmic reticulum. and actually is a storage of calcium ions, which are necessary for basic uh, function of the contractile proteins inside the cell. Now, when you see a, the skeletal muscle under a microscope, you see that it has striations. Remember, these are the indications that there are proteins inside there actually moving to allow the contraction of the muscle. There are many of these proteins found there. You're gonna see what they look like in the book. Here, just as a basic sort of uh, summary of this, there are two contractile proteins, myosin and actin, they're involved in the contraction of the muscle. So myosin and actin actually contract, they allow for the contraction of the muscle, and troponin and tropomyosin are two regulatory proteins that help myosin and actin do the job. They essentially regulate or control the proper movement of myosin and actin uh, in the sarcomere. Now, the sarcomere is the main functional unit of the skeletal muscle that allows the muscle to work, to function, to actually contract. So inside the sarcomere, if you were able to actually magnify it to the level of the molecules, you would see that there's myosin and actin and troponin and tropomyosin, among other proteins that are necessary uh, to allow contractions to occur. Again, for more information about this, make sure to check out the uh, illustrations in our laboratory manual. Now, the next piece of information here that's very important is to keep in mind that in order for any muscle to work, a nerve, specifically a motor neuron, must be present at the point of the muscle in order to send a signal from the nervous system through the neurotransmitters to the muscle so that it actually gets excited, gets contracted. When you see the nerve and the muscle coming together, we call this neuromuscular junction. So again, because these are cells that do movement, this is called a motor neuron that comes to that muscle. Uh, the area there will release, at the neuromuscular junction, will release the specific neurotransmitter at the axon terminal, what we call acetylcholine. This is a neurotransmitter we are coming up a lot in the, when we talk about the nervous system. But essentially here, these are small molecule messengers that travel through the nervous system. In this case, in the musculoskeletal system, the acetylcholine is released to excite the muscle to cause it to eventually to contract. This is all happening also at the synaptic cleft. This is just the name for that area, that kind of a gap between the axon terminal of the motor neuron and the motor end plate or the surface essentially of the muscle. Now, when we look at this, a little bit closely, we see that this is, so the top portion here is, you can see that's the labeled axon terminal. In these little pouches, these are the synaptic vesicles carrying the acetylcholine, that's like the dots here. And once acetylcholine comes to the synaptic plate, is released, it binds actually to the receptors located on the motor end plate, the slower surface of the muscle, and then that activates the action potential uh, throughout the membrane and eventually sends the signal deeper to these contractile proteins and others that we just mentioned in the sarcomere. So again, how does the motor neuron make 
uh, the muscle contract, acetylcholine travels through the axon, eventually winds up here, is released through the synaptic vesicles, through into the synaptic cleft, binds to the receptors on the surface of the muscle, causes the active, the action potential to be uh, kind of activated here, causing electrolytes to move back and forth like sodium and potassium ions. And that eventually sends the signal deeper into the muscle, allows sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium, which eventually causes myosin acting to start moving and the sarcomere is activated. Again, for uh, additional information about this, make sure to check out the pages and illustrations in our lab manual. Now, let's take a look for unit 11 at what the muscles actually look like and the naming of the muscles. So this is what the muscles look like in the person. So we can kind of rotate them like this. We can uh, sort of minimize them. So you see the whole body. And basically we have uh, hundreds of different muscles. We will not be going over all of them, uh, but most of the ones mentioned in our laboratory manual are the ones I'm gonna be going over. And you definitely should be looking over at the Human Anatomy Atlas and in your book to uh, study this and make it easier for yourself to understand where these muscles are located. When we're talking about the muscles, we wanna know the location of the muscle, uh, where they're attached, obviously, in the body, what kind of bones they're attached to, what areas, and obviously what the muscle is doing. Um, now, we're going to look at the head and neck area first and then continue further kind of down throughout the body. Now, for the head and neck area, we have this large muscle on top of the head. Uh, this muscle is called occipital frontalis. I'm going to be just summarizing, uh, sort of abbreviating it as just frontalis in the front. Uh, but it really continues to the back as occipitalis or uh, the occipital belly of the occipital frontalis muscle. This is the muscle for facial expression, right? The frontal part and obviously the occipital portion is there for some of the neck movements. Now, uh, looking at the side of the head, we have three big muscles that help us with chewing of the food. This is the temporalis muscle outlined here, okay, on the side of the head. We have the masseter muscle, which is over here on uh, lower, okay? And then deeper, we're gonna have a buccinator that just kind of deeper in there that I'm gonna outline a little bit later. So the three muscles, again, for chewing of the food is temporalis, masseter, buccinator, okay? There is some others as well that help you with the chewing, but these are the three primary ones I want you to know. Okay, now looking at the face, again, for more muscles of facial expression, we have these round muscles around the eyes. This is orbicularis oculi, right? These allow us to close our eyes tightly. And around the lips, we have orbicularis oris. This is for puckering of the lips, kind of kissing motion. Okay, and remember we had the zygomatic bone here, so we have zygomaticus major and zygomaticus minor next to it. Okay, these are muscles for smiling, right? They're basically pulling the lateral aspect of the lips. Okay. Um, now, when we remove some of the muscles here, okay, we see the buccinator here as promised. Uh, this is one of the other muscles for chewing. Okay, let me see it's lying really deep inside there. Um, moving on a little bit further down, we have the platysma. This is a muscle for frowning and kind of tightening the anterior skin of the neck. Uh, if we actually remove the platysma, we see the trapezius in the back. This is a very important big muscle and we have the sternocleidomastoid. Now the trapezius was for flexion extension of the neck. The sternocleidomastoid is to turn the neck right, to turn the head right and left. Okay, so this is a big muscle. Why is it called sternocleidomastoid? It's because essentially it attaches 
to the mastoid, which is that part of the temporal bone behind the ear, and has the other two attachments at the clavicle, that's the cladal part, and the sternum, obviously, the manubrium of the sternum at the this aspect here lower. Okay. So, um, now let's... Uh, Let's go to the back portion. Again, so we have our trapezius. This is a very large muscle. You can see it goes all the way down there. This is essential for uh, flexion extension of the neck. Uh, we have the deltoids, the left deltoid, the right deltoid. This is for abduction of the arms, or essentially lifting the arms um, away from the body. Remember, abduction, abduction movements, abduction when you move the arms away from the body. Uh, adduction, bring them back. So let's just kind of focusing on this area. If we remove the trapezius, we see our scapula exposed a little bit, and this is the spine of the scapula. So we have all these different muscles like the rhomboids major, rhomboids minor. These muscles allow for the rotator cuff joint or the joint of the shoulder to move in many directions. Remember, there are three bones that make up the rotator cuff, and that's the clavicle, the humerus, and the scapula. So because so many movements are possible at the shoulder joint, we have all these multiple muscle groups involved there to help that joint have all those possibilities of movement. Again, remember, we have the deltoid. We can hide the deltoid. We can see there's a deeper muscle like the infraspinatus here. We have the supraspinatus, we have the levator scapula that elevates or lifts up the scapula, and a bunch of other muscles as well there. Okay. Again, in this area, we are primarily interested in levator scapula, rhomboids major minor, infraspinatus, supraspinatus, and of course the deltoid that we already kind of removed here. Okay. Going further down in the back, we have the latissimus dorsi, Muscle, big muscle, this is involved in abduction, um, adduction rather, sorry, of the arms, again, at the shoulder. And we have this deep group of muscles there. We're gonna call these um, erector spina group of muscles necessary for posture, for standing upright. So some of these muscles are, uh, part of it is the serratus, uh, part of it is lungissimus, and iliocostalis, and spinalis. Uh, those muscles, when you group them together, not including the serratus here, not including this muscle, actually are going to be for erector spina group of muscles. Again, they're deep muscle groups, important for posture, for standing up straight. And again, they are located underneath the big muscle latissimus dorsi here, as you can see. Okay, now let's move to this side, to the front of the body now. Okay, so let's put the muscles back. So looking at this portion, we have the pectoralis major. When you remove that, you have the pectoralis minor underneath. These muscles uh, are essentially for, again, for abduction of the arms, uh, the, the big muscles on the chest. Then again, looking at the arm, there are many different muscles in the arm. Uh, we're gonna only focus on just a few of them. Again, remember, we have the deltoid for abduction of the arm. We have the biceps brachii. Uh, there's long head and short head of the biceps brachii. That's in the front. And in the back, we have the triceps brachii muscle. Okay, and on the side here, we have the brachioradialis. So all the muscles on the anterior of the arm will be the flexors muscle, so they flex. And all those in the back, like the triceps, are the extensors, okay? So again, for the arm, we have the deltoid, we have the biceps, we have the triceps, and we have the brachioradialis. Going down to the chest, we also have serratus anterior muscle. We have the external abdominal oblique. If we remove that, we have the internal abdominal oblique, okay? If we remove that, we have our rectus abdominis. Rectus means straight. This is a straight muscle that goes all the way down uh, from the xiphoid process all the way to the pubic bone, uh, passing through this entire abdominal region. 
Uh, this is like the six pack that we all know. Uh, so everyone has that, but this is just about how much abdominal fat, sort of the super fat you have. And the, the more fat is removed, the more this, these muscle, uh, these uh, connective tissue areas are more visible. Okay. So again, we have external abdominal oblique, we have internal abdominal oblique, and we have the rectus abdominis. And there's actually deeper even muscle in the neck, like the transverse abdominis. Okay, this is a little bit less important right now. Okay. Okay, so looking at the body, we have looked at the head and neck region. We looked at the back. So let's look at the leg portion now. So the muscles in the leg, these are the quadriceps in the front and the hamstrings in the back, right? That's the general term. So there, we're actually going to name most of these muscles here. So looking at the leg, the best way to do is to have some kind of a, a method of naming them, right? They're supposed to just kind of randomly going over them. That's going to make it very easy to confuse them. So going, always I like to go from using, looking at the left leg here, um, we're gonna go from the inner aspect, from the medial to the lateral side, right? So uh, the first muscle is the gracilis, okay? Remember, muscles of the quadriceps here, uh, these are the extensors of the hip and the knee, okay? So again, we have gracilis, we have adductor longus, we have the sartorius, right? Very interesting, very big muscle, you can see it goes all the way from the lateral aspect of the hip and crosses the midline here and goes to the medial aspect of the knee. And then the next muscle is the vastus medialis, right? Vastus like big, vast. And rectus femoris is that straight muscle, right? Femoris or the femoral areas because the femur, the bone there in the thigh. And then we have vastus lateralis on the side. And the last muscle is tensor fasciolata. Again, all of these muscles, they do slightly different moves, but essentially could be grouped as quadriceps, as muscles for uh, extension of, at, at the knee and at the hip. Um, so now, again, just to go over this very quickly, we have gracilis, adductor longus, sartorius, vastus medialis, rectus femoris, vastus lateralis, tensor fasciolata. When you move the person this way like that, we have the gluteus maximus muscle, you can remove that, and we have the gluteus medius, and then uh, there's some other smaller ones in the, there. Um, now again, these muscles in the back, these are primarily as flexors of the knee, okay? Um, and two muscles that we're interested in here is the Biceps femoris, this is specifically the long head of biceps femoris, and then semitendinosus, and you'll see there's also gonna be semimembranosus right underneath that. Okay, so biceps femoris, semitendinosus. And when you go to the back here, we have our gastrocnemius, right? These are the calf, the big calf muscles. When you remove the gastrocnemius, hide that, we have soleus, okay? So what's important about gastrocnemius, it has this long, the Achilles tendon, and you can see outlined here. Right? This is the largest tendon, the body that goes all the way to the calcaneus, to um, our tarsal bone, okay? So again, long muscle. This is for plantar flexion of the foot. Um, and the soul is actually attached a little bit differently, okay? And then when you go to the front, we have also, uh, so not this muscle, but we have our tibialis anterior. That's for, as you can see where it's attached, essentially for the, to helping you with the dorsiflexion <coughs> to some extent. Okay, and we have the other muscles here going to the, to the digits as well. Okay, now one last group of muscles that I wanna go over is actually if we remove, or right, let's kinda of go back here. 
So looking at the eyes, right, we, you see there's actually six extraocular muscles attached to the eyeball that move the eye, okay? Let's kind of uh, remove this bone, kind of remove this bone. Okay, you see there's these multiple muscles, right? Okay, so the best way to do it is essentially uh, there's two muscles on top, two muscles on the bottom, one at the medial aspects, one at the lat uh, lateral aspects. So the straight muscles there, right, these are straight ones, they're called rectus. So medial rectus, lateral rectus, superior rectus, inferior rectus. And those that make like an angle, they are called obliques, like superior oblique and inferior oblique. For instance, this is the lateral rectus, like I said, right? That one is the medial rectus. This one is the superior rectus. I have the eyeball. Um, okay. I have the inferior rectus, and then we have the inferior oblique, just kind of wraps around like that, and we have the superior oblique. Okay. Okay. So do 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 do. So when we're looking at the eye. Okay. So. Medial rectus makes the right eye look to the left. Lateral rectus makes the right eye look to the right. Superior rectus makes the eye look up. Inferior rectus makes the eye look down. And then superior oblique, that muscle there, allows the eye to look down and out. And inferior oblique allows the, the eye to look up and out. Or basically up and laterally. That's another way of saying it. Okay, and obviously we keep in mind that we have both eyes, right? So the extraocular movements need to occur in unison. Okay, this is actually not in this chapter, but could be later in the book uh, when we talk about the eye anatomy. But again, you can refer to it here, essentially because this is important for when we're studying the muscles in the body. Again, make sure to look at all the pictures, all the illustrations, um, and... Uh, trying to study and memorize these muscles. Again, you're responsible only for these muscles that I'm talking about here. Uh, again, for units 10 and 11.